screening. Um, firstly, I'm going to set the context of the MOD in UK Stratcom estate and our carbon emissions. Uh, I know you're all very much aware of this, but it's very much scene setting. And then I'll move on to the challenges we have and we are facing on our overseas estate, uh, including issues around reporting, climatic changes, and then the challenges we face trying to adapt and deliver those changes. Uh, and then finally, I'll go and talk about our main lessons learnt, uh, particularly around our delivery um, overseas and the need for governance and innovation um, and the means to deliver uh, in the overseas space. So I'm sure you're all very aware of the MOD strategic approach, but as this is the cornerstone that we're working to, I thought it'd be an appropriate place to start the presentation. Uh, moving on to the UK Strategic Command. It's our vision for a living, working and training environment that supports the delivery of cutting edge capabilities and the integrated operating concept and makes our people feel valued and is environmentally sustainable. Now we're doing this through four main pillars which are prioritise, rationalise, modernise and maintain. But rather than having a separate sustainability pillar, we're very much seeing sustainability as the lens through which we look for all of our decision making. Um, you'll also see our critical drivers along the bottom. Uh, really important to focus that culture and team are the first two. They're the two that we see are vitally important to enable us to deliver our sub strategy. Saying about sustainability and the lens through which we look, it is a huge and, and vastly ranging definition. So in this presentation, I'm, I'm going to bound today by thinking only about infrastructure in the estate and really looking at the performance indicator around the elements of the green and government commitments. Um, so looking at uh, emissions, but also looking a bit at water and waste. So start with a bit of context about UK Strategic Command and our estate. We don't have the scale of the army estate, nor do we have the condensed areas of the naval bases. But what we do have is a, is a complex estate which consists of 32 establishments worldwide, of which nine are quite significant overseas bases. We've got 10 standalone compost parcels. We've got nine embedded medical locations, and we have 350 lodges across our defence estate. Uh, as well as that, we have the highest number of defence critical national infrastructure, sorry, within the MOD. Like the rest of the TLBs, we operate under the strategy for defence infrastructure um, and we recognise that we've got an, a vitally important play, part to play in infrastructure in enabling UK strategic command to um, and the government to achieve sustainability and climate change commitments. Um, that includes obviously our net zero greenhouse gas emissions, um, but also looking at the green recovery. In our overseas estate, uh, we've got a wide range of, of locations which are permanent and they pose quite different challenges, um, but also some opportunities uh, when we start looking at sustainability and resilience, particularly around climate change. So where does UK Stratcom sit in terms of emissions and what's the scale of our problem that we're looking to address in terms of uh, climate change and sustainability? We are 14% of the total MOD emissions uh, and our estate accounts for 22% of the total MOD estate. Um, by coincidence, within UK Stratcom itself, the estate also accounts for 22% of the emissions that come uh, as a total from, from the UK Stratcom element. And 50% of, of this is actually from the overseas estate. So it's quite a significant element when you consider the number of estates and land parcels that we've got, that nine of them are overseas and they account for 50% uh, of our 22%. Now, 22 may not sound like a significant amount, but what we're absolutely trying to, to hammer home in terms of uh, knowledge and experience is that when you consider that 60% uh, 68% of our emissions come from capability, we don't currently have any levers or any ready answers to be able to get after that 68%. However, that 22% that the estate are providing, we do have some answers for. We do have uh, the ability to achieve a reduction and that's really where we should be focusing our efforts uh, and therefore focusing our delivery and our funding priorities. And they should be uh, attained 
but it does need to be at the debt without the detriment or delay or anyone suffering in the short term and that's quite a critical part it's going to be a long journey on this process but we need to be able to keep everyone with us behavioral change will be a significant part and if people start seeing detrimental changes in the short term we might lose them on that journey for the medium and long term for which we absolutely need them to have any sustained impact so this brings me on to the first of our big challenges that we found when we've been operating both in the UK but significantly in the overseas estates and that's the knowledge around net zero and what does it mean I'm sure you're all aware of the three scopes but the question I ask is how many other people are particularly in the non-infra or the capability spaces. We found it's been all too easy to tag net zero to projects or programmes, but this is meaningless unless everyone knows and understands and also accepts the boundaries that we are talking about. So I've put this up here and this is our, our main infographic about the Defence Carbon Baseline. But when we're starting to look at projects, we're looking at different elements and different scopes. So, for example, Project Apollo in Cyprus is not addressing employee commuting. But when you're talking to the seniors, they are seeing the defence carbon baseline as a whole. And that can lead to some challenging conversations, particularly when we're starting to go through the scrutiny and approvals process. And we're talking about escalating project costs. But we're not apparently seeing the whole picture we can't address the whole picture through individual projects and that can be quite a challenge in building that knowledge and understanding of what we're measuring how we're measuring it and therefore what levers we can and can't pull around a project and therefore what is its value um, we're also finding that there isn't a consistent approach to the cost of not doing something um, and that at the minute is, is proving some challenges because justification justification for projects are being made around Ardell savings. And that doesn't give the full picture of why we need to do a project in the long term if we don't have a true value for carbon emissions and also the lived experience and the social license. So that's our first main challenge. Our second main challenge that we found is that the net zero and carbon emission reporting is uh, very much based around UK uh, conversion factors and UK figures you know it's a DEFRA paper it is very UK centric the government greening commitments only apply in the UK so when we're talking about conversion factors for the fuels for energy and for water and wastewater and uh, waste itself all these conversion factors um, which are having to be applied on the UK and overseas estate are giving quite a false picture and I'm just putting all this up to, to sort of show the amount of work that is going behind the DEFRA figures which is fantastic for the UK but they're giving us a false picture of our overseas estate so when we talk about 50% of our overseas estate um, contributing towards the emission factors actually that's probably going to be significantly more but we can't justify that at the minute because we don't have the conversion factors agreed so what we've agreed in the UK is that and UK Stratcom is that we will apply the UK factors so that we have something to be able to compare but we need to recognize that the overseas grids for example Cyprus are nowhere near as green as the UK grids so actually it's providing a skewed picture but it will give us at least a picture while we wait for specific factors to come for places like Cyprus or, or the Falklands however it's really important that whenever we have conversations we're finding that we need to explain um, this and the thinking around why we've chosen to go with the UK factors but also prepare for the limitations that this is going to give in terms of reporting and the fact that figures are very likely to change as we, we develop our understanding of how the process works and the emissions and what that means so actually the picture is most likely to get worse before it gets better even though um, we are looking to to fund additional projects and to start addressing the change we won't see the change in terms of reporting until we've addressed the knowledge around the carbon factors so i've said that we've applied it this is what happens when we apply the uk factors to our carbon estates um, as we say overseas is around the 50 percent mark interestingly the the main sources from cyprus is electricity for cooling uh, and also from the Falklands and Ascension Islands 
that's very much heating oil. Um, and like I say, this will be very interesting when we start developing our knowledge around the scope as well. That will start skewing the factors, um, particularly in terms of things like transportation. So to meet our net zero, we've got a, um, a huge challenge. We need at least a 10% reduction annually to try and get our figures down to over 110,000 tonnes that need to be reduced. In the UK and overall, you can see that we are on a downward trajectory, but this is very much coming from the UK grid that is greening. We don't, as UK Stratcom, have any large scale solar air source heat pumps or battery storage elements at the minute. We are in the process of, of developing a plan. So we are starting to target the highest emitting estates, both UK and overseas, to fully understand their usage and emissions. And we've got that as a two phase plan. So we not only need to understand what is there at the minute. So for things like building energy management system, effective metering, but also through analysis through estate management plans and renewable energy surveys to understand where the opportunities will lie and where the best bang for our buck is effectively going to be spent. We've also started investigating spend to save initiatives, uh, and that's very much based around reducing electricity usage and on-site generation and microgrids, uh, which is meeting the estate demands. We're looking at the technology to decarbonize heating uh, and ways of reducing, reducing heat loss on the existing estate. Flip that to Cyprus when it's very much about cooling. Uh, and we're also looking at providing infrastructure support programs like electric vehicle charging points. But the key for that is that we need coherent programs which are based on demands, but that also recognize the site capacity and limitations and also try and link it into power generation. So the good news is that we hope by all of um, all UK Stratcom sites will have an EMP, a sort of state management plan by the end of Epoch One and the funding uh, to be able to get after the things identified in the EMPs and the renewable energy surveys is coming in Epoch 2. But I think like everyone, we are very much recognising that there isn't the funding to solve every problem uh, and the pace of delivery will remain a challenge throughout. Uh, so we're very much having to look at a prioritised uh, approach um, and it's not just prioritising, obviously, within our estates and our land parcels, it's prioritising as a whole. Um, so looking perhaps thematically, um, things like addressing SLA demand, addressing uh, solar rather than looking to, to individual programmes uh, and having a piecemeal approach. So as you're aware, uh, you know, in terms of our overseas estate, uh, the challenges that we are facing are very much being amplified. Uh, so where we're currently operating the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East uh, is a high risk of climate change and is identified as a climate risk hotspot, uh, specifically for droughts, heat waves and wildfires. Not only impacts the estate, but impacts how we use the estates. Um, and Oman itself um, particularly has experienced high nighttime temperatures of over 40 degrees. Um, so we're really struggling or sort of starting to challenge the thinking uh, when we start looking at development of our bases overseas. And uh, this is very much where we're fairly lucky in Stratcom. And uh, I don't think Colonel Adams is, is here today, but linking into knowledge that, that you've got in the deployable estate and how you're addressing those challenges is absolutely something that we're, we're bringing in uh, to look at perhaps some of the more permanent establishments that are looking to develop in, in the near future. As well as that, we have the British Indian Ocean territories, which are atoll islands, so they're very low elevation. They have a high risk of impact from sea level rise, uh, and this coupled with an increased risk of severity and frequency of tropical cyclones, that uh, means there's a significant risk on the housing, the infrastructure, the drinking water availability, and also ground salination. Uh, we're starting to see uh, weather events in Cyprus, uh, things like dust storms that actually impact on the operation of PV panels and some of our renewable energies. Um, and that's both in terms of efficiency, but also damage. And that brings in questions about um, maintainability of, of assets. And that, that sort of brings in the challenge of not only do we have to develop and reduce our carbon baselines, but how do we ensure that the long term operation is going to be there? Through all of that, uh, while we recognise that the GDCs don't apply to our overseas estate, we are 
uh, intend to apply the, the uh, targets to the entirety as best practice. So that means that we are starting to hold ourselves to account on achieving GGCs in the overseas space. We're just not reporting that up uh, as part of our main GGC reporting. And this is a huge challenge for us. The overseas grids are all significantly less green uh, than the UK grid. And we can't rely on them greening at the same pace as the UK grid to help us achieve our targets. So we're really looking um, to reduce our carbon emissions with a significant guided investment, um, which makes us more independent. So that's increasing our resilience, um, but also with the development of microgrids uh, and development of generating renewable power. Saying that there are challenges. So obviously working in the overseas estate, we are working within bounds of the, the, the local uh, government and that can provide challenges with perhaps traditional agreements that we've had about power generation. So um, we need to balance our understanding of where we operate with the opportunities that we can take. And that's absolutely where the EMPs are starting to help us. The challenges around uh, data reporting and the conversion factors is recognised in the Roadmaps UK Defence Carbon Measurement Framework. But I think it's fair to say that at the minute we don't have the scrap knowledge or time to develop this uh, for our overseas estate as much as we'd like. So we're struggling to ensure we have a consistent baseline and a consistent message about accurate measurements and reporting against the KPIs. And like I say, really having to, to push the message that things will most likely look worse while we actually start to, to address the change simply because there is transitional increase in knowledge around the appropriate emissions factors in some of our overseas bases. We're also finding that the changing climate is adding uncertainty to our projects. So for example, in some areas of Cyprus, um, they have a naturally hotter climate. And so the houses currently qualify for having air conditioning. However, increases in temperature, other areas in Cyprus are starting to, to hit that, co that qualification baseline and, and the baseline temperatures. And that's starting to pose questions to projects, particularly when we start looking at the big projects like Apollo that is happening in Cyprus. Um, so should the designs uh, be allowed to have or designers have an allowance for putting air cons in for something that doesn't currently uh, comply with requiring it, but in the future it might? Uh, do we go for the fitted for but not with approach or actually do we need to take a significant look at the baseline conditions and should they be raised? if we are looking at a two degrees to four degrees uh, rising of global temperatures is it appropriate to assume that therefore other areas need air conditioning or do we need to adjust our baselines and those are some really challenging questions that, that we're starting to ask ourselves uh, and we're absolutely working with industry to provide a bit of guidance on what that thinking should be so i don't want to dwell on the well-known uh, climate change uh, challenges. I just want to highlight in this slide that there are a significant amount of risks that are being identified by our CIRAMs, uh, so climate impact risk assessment methodology, uh, and note the, the range and locations which are impacted. It's also really important to, to recognise that the UK sites being resilient have an absolute criticality on some of our overseas estates, and there's a number of second and third order consequences which are impacting on our vision. Uh, and how we operate and that needs to be considered but I'm not going to touch on that on our presentation today. So our picture for overseas unfortunately we are very much looking in the bottom L so in the unprepared but with some financial resources, unprepared but without all of the financial resources and also having some underfunded estate which is non-compliant and not resilient. Um, and the main reason for that is is SQUEP in terms of time and resource needed to understand the challenges, but also we need to address the disparities in terms of policy uh, to be able to meet our guidance and our aspirations. So what do I mean by disparities? I'm going to simply look at one element, uh, which is around energy efficiency. So the aspiration is that we have 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year of energy efficiency. The uh, JSP guidance at the minute in terms of the BPSs is 35 for accommodation and 55 for offices. So there's already a bit of a delta between the UK aspirations and the mod JSPs. 
the real thing for me is that there is currently no way of measuring that. We don't have significant low level building meters that we can address uh, a building and therefore understand its energy usage. Also, a lot of our buildings are not as completely simply cut and dried as accommodation or offices. Um, so if we really want to be able to start looking at that efficiency, we either have to address how we define our buildings or we're starting to really drill down in, into the metering and the understanding. Sometimes we can do that with BIM and the modelling. Unfortunately, one of the challenges that we have both in the UK and the overseas is that some of our assets are not appropriate to be, to be modelled in terms of BIM. Uh, and so digital twinning is not necessarily the answer. So we're starting to, to look at ways of how we can measure uh, and what's appropriate, but therefore how we can also hold designers and our MPP teams to account to make sure that we are getting the benefits that we believe. Because at the minute it's being very challenging when projects or refurbishments are coming in uh, and we're looking into their initial reviews through their gateways and through the balance of investments without data uh, about how this has been applied and about without recognition that you can achieve uh, those standards that we are effectively paying for, it's really difficult to make a balance of investment decision uh, and we can't recognise those benefits and feed it back to seniors that there is a significant benefit for them to be able to uh, to back spending additional CDL when obviously there are significant other pressures and capability is always there in the background to be able to to want to spend the money. We then add in the complexity that even if we can measure the elements, it's reliant on the people using the buildings correctly. And that brings me on to my next topic, which is accurate requirement setting. So not only when we use set the, the user requirements, do we need to understand the building, how it's going to operate climatically in the future. We also need to start understanding the people drivers. Are we going to go down the road where the operators have no control? over the building so the building itself is fully autonomous or and it, it manages itself or do we look for the users to have full control um, and therefore we need to start looking in the lived experience but also start to really understand where we're going in terms of the step change in behaviors and cultures about how people use spaces and when we need to get after that we really need to start addressing their culture and their knowledge of how a building uses heat uses power and therefore start if we do want to go down the no controlled space of the building having empowered decision making about how people use spaces we also feel the challenges when we look at designing for sustainability so um, we have face challenges around a lack of squip uh, when designers push back so it's that power and internal challenge and having the confidence for internal challenge we can absolutely lean on some of the, the SMEs at the minute, but they are obviously spread incredibly thin. So we need to start disseminating some of that knowledge down to be able to have the confidence to push back when designers perhaps choose an equipment approach over a building fabric approach, um, because that isn't perhaps beneficial for us in the long term. We also need to start fighting what I'm going to call the PR, which is it's very difficult uh, to explain perhaps why an air source heat pump is not the most appropriate solution when you're going to install it on a old leaky building um, into a um, an establishment that is already quite at capacity with electricity and we're just pulling off the grid there is no um, green or renewable power that is feeding it but you've got to challenge that against the seniors who want a headline you know when we start reporting it is not appropriate to start reporting about number of air source heat pumps or number of um, perhaps new boilers when in fact we are not addressing the main challenge which is the leaky buildings the old assets um, we are could effectively be pouring good money after bad and we are looking to overheat our perhaps already at risk um, electrical power supplies particularly when you start looking at the drawers for things like electric vehicle charging so there are some real difficult challenges that we have to get around and an awful lot of this will be addressed by how we start building the knowledge and building the base understanding around sustainability and what that means. In the overseas, we're facing hurdles on embodied carbon and that very much harks back to the scope again. So 
in the UK, we're getting better at understanding through life costs. Again, we're still in the Ardell, Cdell space rather than perhaps carbon. But if we transfer that to our overseas estate and we take that journey out and we place it with a trip halfway around the world and we're no longer operating in a city, we're operating in an extreme environment, it raises the questions that we're not necessarily equipped to address. Um, so, for example, we've been looking at modern methods of construction, uh, modular volumetric constructions. They don't necessarily stack up for the Falklands or Cyprus when we're using carbon to effectively transport air, particularly if you're looking at volumetric construction. Um, so it pushes the shift. We're starting to look more at flat pack solutions. But that then leads to a challenge around being able to use the local workforce. Um, we're looking to perhaps get them to, to work in their non-traditional mediums. Uh, and do they have the scrap to be able to adhere and construct to the necessary tolerances? And if they don't, well, then are we bringing in contractors from uh, the UK? We're shipping them down. We're adding to the to the cost of the carbon in terms of that transport because we're other bringing people down. What happens if that assets break? Do we have to fly people or parts halfway around the world? So really, it's adding some some real questions for us in terms of um, that new through life and also whether refurbishment is is the appropriate manner. This is then bringing us challenge again because we've got uh, different procurement methods. So we're already challenging the overseas estate. We work with different models. So we have the OPC rather than FDIS. So simple things like BEMS call off isn't, isn't included. Saying that, we are developing the contracts and OPC is due for a refresh and we're doing an awful lot of work around being able to bring in those thought processes. So bring in PEMS, but also bring in uh, sustainability and renewable energy surveys as a default into the contract. So that is absolutely fantastic news. Uh, and that is really helping us get after that, that challenge that we're starting to see uh, and move forward. So I'll start going on to our, to our lessons learned. Um, I've painted a challenging picture for us, but this is giving us some greater opportunities. You know, it is inherently sunnier in Cyprus. It's hotter in Oman. It's windier in the Ascension of Falkland Islands than it is in the UK. And we are absolutely looking to industry to, to help us take advantage of these conditions and maximise our power generation, while also increasing our thermal storage and reducing our carbon footprint. So, for example, in the, the EMP that is about to start in the Falklands, we very much ask them to, to look at ways that we can overcome the issues with particularly high wind speeds um, so that how that we can generate using wind turbines and it is not too windy for them, but also being able to smooth out the supply to meet the demand. These uh, implications that we're starting to look at also raise questions about the flexibility of our infrastructure and what it can be capable about in the future. Um, we're starting to think through our EMPs about what our drivers for sustainable decisions are. So again, in the Falklands, asking that question that if we can start to generate almost limitless power, is it better to retrofit an existing building, even if it remains particularly leaky and inefficient in terms of uh, heat and energy usage, um, rather than having a new building that is much more efficient but shipped down transported down constructed perhaps not with a national uh, the the usual workforce and that will have a significant carbon footprint so we're absolutely starting to try and, and delve down and get some worked examples of what that means in the future and what the appropriate methods to use are we've also said that we've got the uncertainty around not only the climate but capability requirements so we need to increase resilience and flexibility of our own requirements and designs uh, when we're planning for professional uh, potential developments. So an example of this is, is the work that's currently been done to think around a MAN uh, and how that could develop. So we need to understand at a very high level the master planning. So looking at where is the, the most appropriate place to put it? Can we start putting in uh, support infrastructure early? Um, so that we can take advantage uh, as and when funds come through, that we can build uh, effectively buildings, but we know that they are built in the right orientation. We've looked at how things like the wind that comes through will impact what can we gain from solar shading uh, and what can we gain from cooling and what's the most appropriate place to start building. 
So I'm going to, to delve into a little bit about Cyprus uh, as part of Project Apollo, which is seismic strengthening. There's significant um, emphasis on understanding these future conditions, um, both in terms of usage and, and uh, climate. So what you can see here is the new build housing stock that is going in. Um, and so we effectively know, ironically, that SFA remains SFA. But the climate conditions are a big one in the natural hazards. So we've started to use um, future climate modelling. Uh, and that is very much where we started to address the challenges around air conditioning, which no one had really considered until we added in the additional um, nuanced climate modelling. And we've also started to understand how the buildings are used uh, um, to maximise the low uh, level behavioural benefits. So we did surveys of how the existing users are using their houses, what is beneficial, what isn't beneficial, right down to understanding things like solar shading. So, for example, the columns that you can see in this bottom picture here, therefore a significant external shaded area, so like a pergola. Um, there's also outside storage, uh, which you can't quite see in any of these pictures out the, the back in the small garden. So the gardens are small. Mainly that was for maintenance, but also reducing any requirements for waters, but they still obviously fit in the uh, the obligatory swimming pool. Um, but having cool outside storage space absolutely has a huge benefit in terms of increasing the lived experience. Um, and that is the hope that we will then move away from individuals organising their own air conditioning systems, which are retrofitted. Um, and by doing that, we are hoping that while we recognise that there are simple additionals that people might like to do, so for example, aircon, that they won't feel the need to do it as much because the buildings have been done, designed much more sympathetically in terms of their orientation and enabling people to move around the spaces. Saying that, we recognise that, that technology is improving. So we're adding in simple additions like fitted for but not with air conditioning ducts. So there are already um, ducts in the side of the buildings that would be in the appropriate locations if anyone did want to put in any air conditioning in the future. Uh, and this is very much to prevent damage to the building fabric. Um, and that will then in turn hopefully discourage people from, from putting in their own uh, solutions. We've also decided to use local materials and local supply chains, uh, not just for the buildings, but also for the wider sustainability questions around uh, social value for the local procurement. It also increases the maintainability, as I've said before, um, and it reduces the time for fix on fail. So while we're moving away from fix on fail in terms of how we are managing our contracts going forward, it is inherently quicker to be able to get a local contractor to solve a problem with a local solution than waiting for something in the UK to be able to come out and address it and move forward. Um, and this is very much understanding and clearly articulating the scopes. So unless you are absolutely measuring the full scopes, you don't necessarily see the benefit of saving on business transport or flying parts over when you consider projects if that's not within your scope requirement. So all coming back to absolutely the criticality of understanding the scope and understanding what we are asking and what we're going to measure against. We've also worked on challenging the standards and addressed where it's not appropriate. Uh, and this has been successful uh, in Project Apollo because we have a dedicated role whose responsibility is to look at this sustainability as a whole. And that person is therefore empowered to be able to challenge the designers and start questioning whether perhaps an equipment solution is the most appropriate or whether we should really be looking as equipment as, as the last opportunity and we should be addressing it in every other way forward. Um, we've also looked at the benefits realisation piece. So again, looking at controls and submetering and making sure that we can start having a picture of what these changes are doing and what they are reducing in terms of energy, in terms of water usage. And that will then help us as we move through the uh, Apollo programme to tweak and, and really refine the solution. And absolutely with the with the contractors working on the knowledge that this is effectively painting the fourth bridge. The houses that are built at the front end Apollo will not be as good as the back end. And actually, we need to be able to start building in that retrofit piece and the acceptance of a retrofit as we move forward. 
all of this has required a significant upskilling in terms of the contracts, the contract management, but also in terms of the requirements managers, those within DIO working as the project managers and the supply chain as a whole. So really the last thing I want to talk about is governance and that is perhaps where I'll hold my hands up and say that we've come unstuck. We need to use the local knowledge, but we also need to recognise the limitations of that knowledge and have good governance structures in place. We need to empower small scale projects, but we need to have that central coherence and checking so that we either don't paint ourselves into a corner, but also we fully considered the second and third or the consequences of any of the implications. And that's particularly important in the overseas estate when we look at the local governance, but also in, if, for example, in Cyprus, the environmental and historic conditions that we are working in. So the good communication is absolutely critical uh, and that has either led to some successes but has also led to some failures. Uh, innovation, finally, we absolutely need to tap into the enthusiasm that we have. However, there have been significant challenges around how we accept uh, projects onto the estate from that innovation space. So again, I look to colleagues in terms of perhaps more deployable solutions uh, as the ability to, to use that innovation but then try and bring that innovation back into a more permanent uh, solution. And then finally, looking at the opportunities that we have within the TLBs, we don't all need to be getting after the same things, but what we do need to be really starting to recognise is the power of social licence uh, and how we operate going forward and what the expectations are of the workforce, um, both in terms of personnel, but also in terms of the wider support uh, so our consultants and our contractors uh, and everyone that we interact with on a daily basis uh, and we need to start being able to add weight to that when we're starting to make our decisions. So finally we've talked about the means to deliver I just wanted to highlight that within UK Stratcom we recognise that team and resourcing is the first element to addressing our challenges um, and this is something that we absolutely need to develop we've got some great cases of it working in places like Apollo um, but we need to absolutely bring that forward for the rest of our overseas bases, but also back into the UK as well. Um, so just finishing, we've got to change, uh, but we've got to do that through not only ourselves uh, and our knowledge, but also by empowering others to make the right decisions uh, and to be able to force that behavioural change. And that is it from me. Hopefully if you, you can all still hear me. Helen, thank you for that. Um, that was really good. It was great to see some of the things we talked about over the last uh, year or so um, coming to fruition in there. Um, but yeah, thank you for that presentation. I hope you feel better um, and we can see you soon. Um, but um, yeah, go and get some rest. It was Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I, I can only send my apologies for today. And I do apologies for the voice. Um, Catherine will absolutely say I don't usually sound like this. So thank you for the opportunity but also apologies for, for not being there in person thank you
Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with me while I did that little bit of admin, just transferring us back onto how we were. Um, what I'll do now is I'll hand you back over to Jake and Matt for, for um, introducing our speakers. Pretty much just got to say hello. <laughs> I'll bring their name up and they'll, they'll come up and then um, you'll control the uh, Okay. Lovely. Uh, so our next speaker. Yeah, now if you want helping with, with the technology, that would be so literally press next. Thank you very much. And is Caroline here? Hello, Caroline. Brilliant. I've taken the liberty of noting down a few things, and apologies, I should have done this for Helen as well, but I'll do it for Caroline. Um, Caroline Studworth is a director at STEM Explored, where she focuses on collaborative education and skills projects. She guides employers, ed education and trading providers to work with government. Her work covers technical vocational training, apprenticeships and professional development, particularly in the engineering, manufacturing, construction and built environment sectors. She's an advisor to the University College of Estate Management and the Construction Industry Council, working on their climate action plan on the education and qualifications work stream. Welcome, Caroline. I've lost that little machine. Where'd it go? Ah. Hopefully, I'll get the technology to work. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, I am Caroline. Um, technically, I'm here on behalf of the Construction Industry Council, and I should be in, in the appearance of Alid Williams because he actually leads on this, this particular work plan. I'll make it today. Um, so I've been handed over um, the delights of the education and qualifications work stream within the Construction Industry Council Climate Action Plan. So nothing like a snappy title to, to get us going for today. Um, so that's that's where we are. So the Construction Industry Council is a representative organisation of professional institutions, research organisations and very specialist business associations that work across the construction and built environment sector. Um, it represents around about half a million professionally registered individuals globally. Um, so when you think about the UK construction industry and built environment industry, you will realise there's an awful lot more people working in the half a million. Um, and so we have an issue with professionalism in the construction and built environment and making sure that people become professionally registered. That may begin to change once the building regulations change and people are looking at competence. So we do have an opportunity right at this point in time, not only to look at the competence of individuals to do particular roles like architects, engineers, um, water and waste management and so on, but actually to upskill them in climate literacy, sustainability, net zero, digital, um, I'm trying to think of the other things um, that are happening as well, um, and obviously things like equality and diversity to change the face of the construction and built environment industry. And that's one of the reasons why the CIC came together to build this Construction Industry Council Industry Skills Plan for Carbon Zero, and also working alongside the Construction Leadership Council, which is the government organisation that brings um, all these organisations together from an industry point of view. So the CIC brought together its climate action plan um, in last summer. Um, and I am particularly looking at just the educational skills workforce. So how we ensure that we are developing the talent of the future, but also looking at the competence of those already working in the construction and built environment industry. One of the key drivers is obviously there is a UK government, a legal requirement to meet the targets for net zero by 2050. And the construction industry accounts for 40% of UK emissions, so it is a huge task. And we have to reduce those emissions pretty much to zero by 2050. 
To be able to do that, we need a skilled workforce. And putting that in perspective, that 60,000 full-time employees per year rising to 100,000 over the next 10 years to address just the green skills. If you look at the next 10 years for retrofit, domestic retrofit alone, you need 350,000 full-time employees. And we are pretty low on those people that are able to do domestic retrofit very well at this point in time. So this is one of the reasons why the Construction Industry Council is looking to address changes to the professional workforce, but also working with the Construction Leadership Council to make sure that we professionalize the construction and built environment workforce. So I am unfortunately looking at education for qualification, which is not a very happy title. Um, the aim is to bring together the professional institutions in the construction and built environment to push forward the changes that we need to see for the future of our workforce and to address net zero, climate literacy, sustainability. The professional institutions ban those words around, as does industry, but what does it actually mean um, when you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals for education of the future and for the professionalism of, and competence of the workforce? So what we've had to do is look at each of the work streams for education and qualification, is look at the actions that we need to take now in the very short term, in the medium term, in two to three years, and in the longer term. And education and qualification is critical and most of our actions are immediate. We do need to make changes to the way we assess professionals and the standards that are set aside for them to meet that point in time. So there is an action plan put together and we aim to benchmark where the profession currently is, how it needs to move forward collectively and collaboratively, because we all share expertise, and that should be the way we move forward. But we also need to identify where the gaps are, and to bring together the institutions to work collaboratively, collaboratively help one another, and move things forward as a, as a collective. That does mean we need to look at the professional standards, the codes of conduct, the accreditation criteria, the, um, I can go on, and the, the type of assessors that we're putting into universities to look at accreditation, accreditation of programmes, how we assess individuals, are the people who are assessing individuals competent to assess against sustainability. So when you start to unpick everything, you realise that there is also an issue within the profession that we need to upskill those that are supposed to be the experts in engineering, in architecture, to be able to address sustainability. So, breaking it down, entrance to the profession. This is really for, generally, younger people who are entering into the workforce. I say generally, because I look after a lot of apprenticeships, and a lot of apprenticeships now are attracting and re-attracting entrance back into the construction industry and built environment industry and we are upskilling people who used to work in construction or have returned to and they are somewhat older. That is a great thing because you get a mix of um, behaviours um, and different challenges and different um, views on what needs to go into the education pathways to make sure that people become competent. We also need to look at those that are in the workforce um, in terms of their competence um, and I think it was said before, people who are 30 or under haven't even grasped that climate action is one of the biggest issues. And I'm probably one of the people that was educated 20 plus years ago, and I'm having to learn. Um, and everybody should continue to learn, and that is the point of CPD. But in the built environment, CPD has not been mandatory. There's obviously some issues around building safety, and that has brought it to the fore. So what we are focused on initially is making sure that we get the education pathways, the education training pathways right for those that are entering the profession. That means, are we creating the right guidance, the right standards for the edu education and training? And are we as a profession really tackling those who deliver those education and training pathways to upskill themselves and deliver the right technical content in the, in the sort of in the guise of what they're there to do. So if we look at plumbing and heating engineers, are we training them appropriately? Is that the same as people designing properties, designing infrastructure? The answer is probably yes, we do need to give them a base level of competence, but it obviously then needs to expand into more specialist areas. 
And we need to pitch that at the right level so individuals can understand. Looking at engineering, you've got engineering technician, incorporated engineer, and chartered engineer. They're, go, they're all going to have a different level of understanding requirement as you move through those education pathways. So we have to think not only just at the top, but from the bottom where people will enter and progress through the profession. Of key fundamental change is the professional registers and the professional standards that we have. We've got UK spec. UK spec is across a number of institutions in the engineering sector. That will mean different things to different engineering organisations. It gets worse in the construction and built environment industry. And not everybody has got carbon literacy and sustainability embedded in their professional standards yet, would you believe? And they don't also have the guidance that's there. So what we are having to do is work with the institutions that do this and do this well to share that practice back across those different professions and let them benchmark themselves where they are and where they need to go. So that's what we're trying to do at the moment is improve the professional standards but also then improve the professional review processes. So most of you have gone through a professional review interview or assessment at some point in your time. Those professional reviewers might not have the competence to assess sustainability. So we have an issue that we need to upskill those people as well. And as well as the people visiting on accreditation criteria, uh, accreditation visits to universities and so on. So that's, that's what we're aiming to do with entrance to the profession. We need to make sure that when we set requirements for organisations such as universities, colleges, training providers, that we do have the right standards and competence assessment processes in place and make sure that those standards are robust. We also need to work with stakeholders. So we need to work with universities, colleges and so on to ensure that they can really deliver the change that we're looking for. We need to make sure that they have the guidance that's expected to be in place of professionals and work with them to ensure that they can develop and train and change their training programs to assess it. One of the things we are looking to do is make sure that every training program that leads to professionals is matched to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and they start to think more holistically about the life cycle of the built environment and how it integrates with the natural environment and the resources that we have available and the possible implications of climate change. And we need to make sure that we are making sure that our professionals, staff and volunteers do challenge in much more depth. That is what we need to make the transformational change. So we're asking the professions themselves, are their own processes robust enough? Do their team members and volunteers understand what they need to do and are willing to go that step further? And what additional training do we need to put in place to make sure that we can support professionals as a collective? We don't want to be prescriptive because sustainability will be different to different areas of the built environment and different things to different professions. But we do think by working collectively we can get there. The bigger issue, the big issue working with industry is professional registration has not necessarily been mandatory across the built environment. The issue we've got is we also have a global war workforce. And so what we do in the UK isn't necessarily transposed across different organisations. So there is a bit of complexity there with the approach that our professional institutions can take in terms of what they can mandate in different, um, in different regions of the world. However, we do need to work with industry to make sure that people are competent to work in this workplace. And as I say, building safety has been an anchor for us to make the change. Building safety gives us the opportunity to embed sustainability, take action on CPD, but also look at developing digital competencies, competencies alongside that that will improve efficiencies. We are looking to mandate CPD for every single professional. That's not the case currently, um, but it's also to make sure that industry invests in turning their workforce into professionals that then must remain competent. Professional registration gives us that opportunity to do that, but we need to make sure that 
CPD is mandatory. And that isn't as easy as flipping the switch saying you will do CPD. Um, it does require investment from professional institutions. You need the right CPD. There's loads and loads of CPD out there. Most of it is rubbish. So what we do need is looking at the sustainable development goals is a cross industry climate framework curriculum. That means we can build the, the right information at the right level for professionals entering and, and continuing to work within the industry. That takes investment on the long term because what might be right today might change in the future. So we need a long term plan to develop that curriculum. We did try it before, we developed it, and then the funding stopped. It got outdated. So we do need to look at how we work together and invest in that CPD framework um, to be able to have something that is high quality, used by industry, welcomed by industry, and actually does deliver for the professionals that we've got registered. We can only do that once we make sure that CPD is mandatory, our codes of conduct say that CPD is mandatory, and actually we do begin to strike off people who are not carrying out mandatory CPD. And we shouldn't be afraid of doing that. It's not that easy. We're going to have to go through um, sort of professional review interviews every so often to make sure that people are being maintained. Um, is there an easy way of doing that? So one of the things we've worked with the ISRUP team, and every year they say, this is your membership subscription, show me your CPD record. And they're getting around it by not having to do those, those awful interviews with people to say, why haven't you done the CPD? You are having to show your record just as a matter of fact to stay registered as a member of ISRUP team. So there are easier ways of doing it, and it's beginning to share that expertise with each other. So, as I say, CPD, there's lots of stuff out there. At the moment, most of the CPD that is mandated um, is often self-directed. So that means I go away, I go and find a program, I go do three hours of reading or sit in a webinar, that's my job done. Is that really hitting the mark? I don't think so. So a lot of institutions have also gone for the specified hours of CPD. Okay, I'll just tick the box and I'll go and do five hours on, on sustainability, three hours on safety. Is that right? I'm not sure it is. And each individual, depending on where they are in their career, will need a different level of CPD. So is specifying hours the right way? What else do we need to do? What else can we do to make sure that we are getting the right level of CPD to maintain competence, if not improve our competence? Um, and are we, do we have access to the right topics? And the answer to that is probably not. Um, one of the things that institutions can do is offer CPD directly or recognise CPD that others provide. Um, so one of the things that we are trying to do with this climate framework is to do that by working in collaboration. But we need more CPD that is contextualised. So as I say, if I was plumbing and heating engineer, I want to go and look at heat pumps. However, I need to work with somebody who's an retrofit expert to be able to make sure that that leaky building actually will sustain a heat pump. And probably the answer to most methods in the UK is probably not. Um, so we need to work much more collaboratively with each other and actually get out of our little bit little silos. And this work is beginning to push collaborative working together. The other thing is obviously CPD isn't always free. Um, so we need to do much more to get industry in, to invest in CPD and really value it. So what are we actually planning to do now? So we are looking to enhance and provide greater impact. We've got a current benchmark and we've got an action plan to develop a particular toolkit that will help each of the institutions that we work with to take their own self-assessment every year as part of this process benchmark where they are, but we also need to share good practice. What have other organizations done? We've worked with the likes of the JBM who have improved their accreditation criteria, worked with universities and colleges to improve their um, education and training, and also supported their um, accreditation plans to have an, a sustainability expert on them, as well as through professional reviews. So those sharing of good practice case studies is helping other organisations who are particularly small or particularly large um, to work together to share information 
and actually share, begin to share resources across the, the, the built environment footprint. And we'll do that now on an annual basis um, to develop now a cross industry climate framework curriculum that we've been developed. Um, and I'll show you a clip of, the next, of some of the information that we've developed going forward. Third, but um, yet. Um, the next clip, I'm hoping the technology will work for me when I click the button. Um, I'll just click that button. I'm hoping it doesn't currently start. Yes. So one of the one of the organisations I've been working with is the University, University College of Estate Management. They are an online um, university and looking to be the world's most sustainable university going forward. So uh, they are a huge advocate for um, for sustainability, and they they are the, pa the patron was the former Prince of Wales, now King Charles III, who is obviously committed to making sure that sustainability is embedded in everything that happens to tackle climate change and deliver the future workforce. So UCM currently has 4,000 undergraduates um, and postgraduates, um, but it is looking to extend its offer into apprenticeships, into CPD, and do things that tr traditional universities don't always do. Um, and that is much more working with the coalface, with the industry, with the professions to make sure that they develop good quality CPD. What, we, what they have done at the moment is developed currently a free module on energy and the carbon in the built environment <coughs> as, as in relation to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the likes of WEBA are developing other modules and they are going to come together with, within this framework. So completion of this particular course is mandatory for every single member of staff at UCE. Um, as I say, at the moment it is free. It takes 25 hours to complete it, which is quite a lot. About 350 staff have completed it. Um, however, it was free for 12 months to see if we could get this working. And they are going to start chunking it into six sort of six hours of bite-sized learning for individuals to access it, but they will start to charge for it. So if you want to go and do 25 hours worth of CPD on the built environment, join it now and, and crack on with it. And I'm hoping if I hit this link, I'm hoping the technology works. And if not, I'm going to blame Alid. Um, this is what it might look like. I think it might be the YouTube one. It might be better. <laughs> It works on the screen. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, it's just a, it's just a change to give more time. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's always the international action. Yeah. It's quite nice, it's a nice little bit. Well, no. yeah. 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 Anyway, there is a nice little module there for people to tap into. As I say, it is free. I think it's going to be free and oh, until the end of this year. Not got long. Um, but yeah. At least then you can put it on your CPD records and it should be should be done and listed before you know. Even if you've got 30 hours to do, you've got 25 all on sustainability and built environment. So so that's where we are. And that's kind of it from me. Um, I guess the case is watch this space. We'll be upskilling and producing a toolkit in uh, draft is due on Friday. Um, and we will be getting the institutions to use that to make sure that they do develop um, things that are going forward. Um, 
I've completely messed up the screen now, haven't I? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's, that's over and out from me. Thank you very much, okay. Caroline. We will be asking you back. Yes, we will. I fixed it now. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm already starting to see lots of connections between the presentations. Um, our next speaker, Julia Powell, is Head of Policy in the MOD's new Climate Change and Sustainability Directorate, which is tasked with delivering General Nuji's strategic approach. Formerly part of General Nuji's team, Julia now focuses on building a policy team maximizing benefits from the MOD's rural estate, embedding sustainability and carbon into defense decisions, and shaping MOD's response to the security implications of climate change. Hello, Julia. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so morning all, thank you for the introduction. And um, yeah, so basically the directorate is um, the catalyst for change on the back of um, Richard Nugy's work and the publishing of the, um, uh, the strategic approach. And I was going to put up the first slide with some quotes and use a bit of a cliche because we're on a journey and I think we've moved forward significantly with the uh, publishing of Richard's work and our work. And I don't think I would have been stood here talking and having this conversation and hearing the developments that I heard um, 18 months ago. Um, certainly there was a lot going on in the background with infrastructure, but I, just, I don't think that there, you would have seen these sorts of quotes from seniors. Um, particularly, I think the one that's uh, with June this year from the first Sea Lord about that young audience and that young recruits coming through and their values and matching our values. I was quite curious to hear about those statistics that were quoted earlier. I'm slightly worried by that actually, um, <laughs> but um, but I think this is this is massively significant for us. But we also have an awful long way to go. As you've heard from Helen's and um, the previous uh, presentation, skills and culture change are part of that journey. They need to happen to embed the change and make it stick. Um, we're also not unique across government, allies and partners. Um, we're all at similar stages and I think we're all have seeing this similar ch uh, challenge. I was in the States last week talking to the Department of Defence out there and they, in some areas, are slightly further ahead, but some really nice lessons learning, some really nice courses that we can share, particularly in the security implications of climate change and particularly in operational work as well. And we're having regular conversations with MOJ across government and um, sharing and learning from each other. And really interesting, had a conversation with the relet of the resettlement contract as well yesterday because these are skills that are, as we saw, needed out in industry. And we've really got to think about that application as well as our own internal um, application. So a bit of an update, um, first of all, on the work on the strategic approach. And then I'll go into a bit on our, our sort of early stages and our approach and principles for the skills and culture. Um, and I, I, I did have a quote that um, to just talk to Richard, but he's not here, he's gone. I assume he's busy. Ah, uh, there we go. Well, um, I won't use this quote then because he's not on the next um, stage. So, just a reminder I am absolutely sure you will have seen and read the strategic approach, and I'm hoping it's guiding your work. And, and I would just reiterate I think when we wrote these um, ambitions, it really is quite telling of the journey. I think they are still pretty relevant, but we have moved significantly forward. I think we still have an issue around adaptation and resilience 
that's probably one area, particularly on equipment. Our team is only just um, getting our military post in place for that. They come in, uh, Group Captain Jodie Miller comes in in November, coming from the support area. Um, emissions, yeah, we've got that sorted. You heard from Helen's um, proposal. Yeah, there's challenges, but we've got our baseline in place, etc. And as a global leader in the response, it is one of the busier parts of my job, talking to uh, allies and partners, sharing and interacting with um, allies and partners from Israel through to meeting with the Norwegians on Friday uh, over in the States. So it's, it's massive and we are still, still just staying ahead, I think, in this sort of leadership piece that we've, we've got to stay there. And obviously with the premise that we must preserve and enhance operational capability. So just over one year on now, we had 30 to 40 initial actions in that strategic approach. We've um, completed the majority. If you do want to see a summary, we um, published a written ministerial statement. You can go and follow the link and see where we are, get some of the successes and the highlights of that. So the foundations are in place. Um, and we are set on this sort of first epoch journey. As I've said, we have the baseline in place. It is actually probably just a footprint. It's not a baseline because it's a one-off, but the methodology is there. There's an awful lot of work going on with Defence Supplies Forum, um, uh, building a cross-defence portfolio to see what we're all up to because there is an awful amount of work, brilliant work, brilliant enthusiasm, but it's all almost, um, I'm not going to call it chaotic because I don't want to, but some days I feel that it's that. Um, but it's all uh, pushing in the right direction. And then obviously we've got the two next two epochs that you heard um, Helen talking in the epochs terms, and it's good that those sort of principles are sticking and being talked about as we move forward this journey. It isn't, um, it certainly isn't a sprint, it's a long journey. Um, so last, in July, we went back to the Defence Delivery Group um, and we reset our priorities beyond the strategic approach ambitions, drilling down into really what we need to deliver for this next stage of Epoch 1. And um, at that point, CDS said, well, why aren't these already normalized? It's like, right, okay, no, it's brilliant. Brilliant that he believes they should be, and he under, you know, understands their importance. But as I say, this is a really is a long-term um, endeavor. And you'll see there, just to run through, like I said, the a baseline, the, the uh, departmental contribution on net zero, um, many of you will have heard the sectoral approach that we're employing uh, across um, the department. So we're mirroring the UK net zero strategy. Each, um, we have emissions in all but one of the sectors in that strategy. And we have defence leads, policy leads and delivery leads now in each of those sectors, maritime, air, et cetera, um, built environment. To, to lead that work and push that forward. We have trajectories on how we um, how we sort of map ourselves against policy compliance and then how we accelerate away from policy compliance. You'll see there that I'll go into more detail this develop the literacy and wide skills training in the next few slides. Um, but also just to say here, I heard quite a lot in Helen's presentation about the function about scrutiny, about finance and commercial. And our approach in the centre has to be to work through those defence organisations, not just the commands, not just the TLDs, it has to be in the functional areas. So the scrutineers and the financiers are, understand where we're coming from and put it into their policy and process as well. So that is very much front and centre as a priority and sustainable procurement is our first focus. Um, climate risk. We have CIRAM. Again, you heard from Helen. CIRAM's working. It's at its establishment level. But what we are now trying to implement and look at is an organisational level of risk. And not just physical risk, it's transitional risk. Energy transition, uh, technology transition, and how that affects us, our defence strategy, our defence planning. So it's at the biggest level. 
And then the last priority there is part of my team, climate security sort of tag, but it's essentially our response to the security implications of climate change, the geopolitical implications, the uncertainty and the cascade risk of the sort of knowns of drought, um, a different operating environment. But what's that going to mean for future conflict? What's that going to mean for the aggregated picture? So you may have a MACA task that's taking your time in the UK, but you might also be on an operation overseas. And where is the capacity? Have we planned for the capacity? Is defence thinking at the highest level about how we respond to those challenges and the political, geopolitical challenges in the future? So those, that's where we are in the directorate at the moment. And if I um, go to focus down on uh, literacy and skills. So there is an awful lot of work and approaches going on on this. And I think what I need to say is that there needs to be a coherent and I haven't dared open that the Pandora's box of skills and literacy because I have yet to go, get any resource in the center. But we have that, that enthusiasm, we have um, a lot of um, yourselves, the commands, probably less so the functions, all looking at how they can respond to this as well as the external organizations as we've heard already this morning. So we've done an initial scope of the issue and I'll talk through that in the next few slides. I am hoping by next Monday to have a grade seven um, OF4, I think that would be a quote too, skills and culture lead. And I will talk a bit more about the educational needs analysis, uh, analysis workshop that we've got set up. And that is in um, basically in partnership with the, one of the Defence Academy schools. Um, and it's setting that current state, what everybody's doing, what do we need? Um, and it's the start of this particular bit of the journey. So principles, coherence. We have to have coherence. We are duplicating in all aspects of CCS at the moment, um, which is here. Yeah, it's, it's not ideal, but it is where you get the um, steps forward, I guess, as long as we can share that working across and as, as long as we can bring that together and the understanding together. So we want to embed and look towards creating a climate change and sustainability people plan. And that will be in DE08, which is the sustainability um, element and uh, output piece of the new defense plan 23. Uh, and that will direct down through as the defense plan does. Um, and also, as I've said, working through the functions in the defense organizations. So the scoping. This work has um, <clears throat> been in place for a little while. It's been shared and sets out the ambition, but Everyone has their own opinion. There's a program in the planning in all sorts of places within defense. And people are trying to sell or procure the products to respond to this. So we, at this stage, at this early stage of skills and culture, we need to, um, I think, agree what success looks like. We need to understand the incre incremental steps along to achieving this. And also, I don't talk about it much today, but the nudges for the behavior and culture, because it's another whole other massive issue around uh, behavior and culture change. But training and skills uh, are definitely a start on that. So that's why we're starting where we are. We need to capture what the current state is. And we need to engage with the breadth of the functions, the commands and groupings such as yourselves. As I've said, we are starting um, with an educational needs analysis workshop on the 14th of October. We said education because it's not just training. It needs to look broadly and it needs and it's bringing in training schools, commands, other government departments. It's quite broad. And it's hosted at Defence Academy in the Capability School. 
And um, it's being chaired by one of our corporate partners, so the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, who we're working with quite closely in sustainability terms. Um, and they also have a training offer, but they also have quite a good process for setting this current understanding of an organisational need and what is already being done within the organisation. So that will be, the result of that um, day will be a clear starting point. Um, where are the gaps? What's already happening? And um, where we build the offer from? But beyond the benchmark, we need to agree the, um, to maintain coherence. And this was in the scoping exercise, how it was proposed that the um, organization of the offer of who would do what within defense was set out. I, I, as I say, this is a proposal. And I think that um, within the governance of the directorate and the sustainability champions across defense, we need to work out how, after we know that baseline, where those um, roles sit and how much can be offered by either lead commands or um, how much do we need to bring the functions up beyond, uh, you know, because others are, are very well um, developed. Um, I know that there's approaches being staffed in DNS, SDA, Army, Navy, all, everybody has got teams building um, and approaches building. So we, this is just the proposed first step. And I think that it will be a conversation and, a, and, and another, probably a, another workshop when we know what's out there and we've got the understanding of the whole. But as I've said, the functions aren't as mature, but they are key to much of this. Many of the professions and role-based specialists sit within the functions. Um, it's not just infrastructure. Um, and the challenge will be bringing them along as well, the scrutineers the um, finances, etc. So this is essentially the approach that um, Defence will want to hear behind. The scoping exercise set these four audiences. They aren't, they can be mutually exclusive, but an individual could probably fit within several of them as well. Um, there is a pack of information behind this that I can share, and we can it can circulate to get that wider. Um, it has little sort of vignettes of staff examples on who would sit within these four audiences, and it sort of illustrates the application within defence. It's not rocket science. I mean, it's. I think we all know that there is a need we've heard that there's a need for broad awareness through to senior leadership skills but it does set a framework and we can then link after the workshop where are we in each of these areas and what do we need to provide so just to dip into some of them just a bit more um broad awareness and senior leadership are our priorities. I think um, there's a lot of other focus on some of the others, specialist areas of the, and the role-based skills. But um, on the broad awareness and literacy, there's a multitude of courses on the market. We heard and saw the YouTube link just now, although 25 hours is quite a lot, so that might well be just beyond um, broad literacy, but there's carbon literacy project. The civil service learning portal has launched um, in May, June, uh, awareness um, course. There are all the institutes, IEMA, whoever within the industry all have multiple courses, but how should they be provided? How can we reach them? Are they in the right platforms? And should they be mandated? I think there's quite an interesting conversation and the people function are probably the least interested function of all of the functions we're engaging in in defence. So we're working massively um, closely with acquisition, with procurement, 
uh, commercial function, but very, very limited on people on the people function. And I just, I don't currently know what the response would be um, if we said, right, all civil servants, all military, mandated awareness training. And, um, and that's probably where it should be, but I think there's a little way to go on that. Um, senior leaders definitely a, a requires a different approach. It has to be, um, has to be compartmentalised. It has to be tailored to the, what they're looking at. SRLs, ORs, SO. No, that's it. Start again. Senior responsible owners um, on programmes, or just senior leaders of commands and others. It has to be strategic. There's quite a few courses on the market. Um, I know General Richard, both General Richards have been on the Cambridge course. Many others have. I just comp uh, uh, completed the High Impact Leadership course. Brilliant, but hugely, hugely expensive and time consuming. But I know that it is um, that quite a few of our industry partners are talking to Cambridge about um, tweaking that course, applying it for defence, because it talks very much about public sector at the moment. But those sorts of opportunities or the Oxford courses could be what we offer. Um, and Navy are working with PwC at the moment to set out um, a proposal for a senior leadership course that could well be they pilot it, they become the lead command. This is the sort of structure we're looking at because everybody is after the same goal. So it would be sharing and piloting and then learning and, and also SDA have also rolled out a course as well. Then the CCS specialist, again, plethora of courses, be it IEMA or SIEM or your own institutes. They probably need to be tailored, but who are the defence specialists? Do we know who we're talking to? What professions support them? There's a health, safety and environmental profession, property profession, all sorts of professions. And um, we could work to embed and, and get the CPD requirements, et cetera, et cetera, within them. Or, as is being talked about across government, is there a need for a new profession? And I think this is one of the things that my new grade seven will be looking at, the feasibility and the scope, because it is a cross-government um, initiative, is, is there a need for an environmental sustainability or a CCS profession um, uh, with its own competencies, with its own um, sort of makeup and focus? It isn't an easy task if you think how much is embedded in the property profession at the moment, but it doesn't sit front and, front and center of that profession and, and having a profession in its own right would possibly give it more focus. So role-based um, specialist skills. I think this is where many of you would probably place yourselves. And again, growing number of courses at all levels but we need not just the sort of engineering specialisms, but we need to train the project managers, we need to train the scrutineers. Speaking to scrutineers at the moment, on the big Cat A projects within defence, they are crying out for a guide to what they should be assessing. They know things are being engineered out, it's only based on cost, uh, rather like Helen was saying in hers, it's not, it's all sort of either UK centric, it's not thought about in the broad sense. And that's one of the areas we desperately need to get after um, when we're working through the functions. Um, and it aligns an awful lot with costing carbon and a vast amount of other work that we're doing within, um, within the directorate. So. Just a quick canter through um, what we're doing. Uh, at the start of the journey, the workshop on the uh, 14th of October will be that start of the defence sort of hearing uh, approach. I would ask, and I'm not allowed questions now, am I? Okay. Um, I would ask um, what gaps there are that 
for your, your requirements as specialists in your roles, for your teams, for military and civilian, and in resettlement, because I think that's really interesting. And given that that contract is, is trying desperately to relet and relet with that front and center, I think that would be really interesting. I can supply feedback um, slides that we can put into the uh, educational needs analysis workshop on Friday the uh, 14th of October if you wanted to put in as an institute or as a command I've got Stratcom people there I've got army people there I've got a lot of your training people in the room but more than happy to take more input as well so that's where we are Now, if I click this, perfect. Our last speaker, John Krauss, is CEO of Engineers Without Borders UK with a mission to put global responsibility at the heart of engineering. He's held director roles at the International Geosynthetic Society and the Royal Institution of Civil Engineers, where he established the World Built Environment Forum. He's also a former senior UK diplomat, having completed postings in several European cap capitals, where he addressed multilateral issues, including climate change. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just, just a little quick. So I, I was at RICS, the, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, in case anyone was wondering what the Royal Institution of Chartered Engineers is. Um, uh, and and um, actually, there a little bit of sympathy for one of the earlier speakers because we went through a process there of not only asking people to do mandatory CPD, uh, but to record their mandatory CPD. And the, the, just the action of asking people just to let us know what CPD they've done, never mind doing the CPD, just to tell us about it, well, it was actually quite a, a cultural change itself. Now, I must remember, I've got to do this apparently, so this is a weird thing I'm doing to make this camera tracking, so I'm not giving some oath for the Indian stuff. Um, right, so um, let me, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what Engineers Without Borders is, what we do, how we think about some of the global issues that we've been talking about today. And we're more in the cultural space than in the technical space, as I hope to become clear from this morning. I'm probably going to talk about 20 minutes. I do have a short video or two. Hopefully, it's going to work. Um, it's a very good video, so I'm, I'm fingers crossed that it is going to work. Uh, and um, what, um, what we do is we're a not-for-profit organization. We, we started back in about 2004 in engineering faculties in the UK. It's a student-based uh, initiative, which has grown into becoming uh, a not-for-profit organization with a staff team, which is running projects. And today, training somewhere between 10 and 12,000 people a year through uh, our activities. That includes professionals, uh, but it's mainly undergraduates. Now, what we're not, okay, because uh, I'm conscious our brand name is a little bit confusing, a bit confusing to people. We're called Engineers Without Borders. Now, you've probably heard of Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, and all these other kinds of organizations with a Without Borders tag. Uh, and uh, we're not that. So we do not send people into humanitarian emergency situations. We do not send people to go and work in the Amazon or somewhere in Africa to help the community. That's not what we do. Uh, so just want to make that clear. Uh, I'll explain what we do do in a moment. Um, now, the challenges we face, um, no, no borders. Now, somebody said earlier that uh, if you ask people in the UK, they might say climate change is a top risk. Um, well, I, actually, um, I think climate change probably isn't a top risk to say, as a matter of fact. But the question really depends on, on, on what time scale you're talking about. Because the World Economic Forum, for example, asks business people every year what the top risks are. And if you ask them the question, what's the top risk in the next one to three years, climate change is kind of up there, but other things are up there as well. Russia, Ukraine, obviously, uh, global recession, obviously, overcoming and recovering from the pandemic, obviously, the top risks right now. But when you ask those same business leaders, what's the top risks 
in a longer time horizon of five years plus, the top five risks are all environmental, climate change being the top one. So I think it does, it, it's a question of what's your lens, uh, if you want to answer the question about what is, what is the, um, you know, what, what, what is the, uh, the kind of risk you're facing. So the risks that we're facing, they're interconnected, they're interdependent. So if one risk rises and tips over a, a, a tipping point, then there's a possibility of a domino effect for other tipping points. And so when we talk about being without borders, we're talking about dealing with challenges that recognize no borders, challenges that are global, intergenerational, cross-cultural, and so on. And it means that we, in a without borders approach to engineering, have to be thinking in that way. We have to be thinking across sectors, across disciplines, across professions, across cultures. And that's really very much what we're trying to achieve. Now, our vision is that we need to balance the needs of people and planet. It's as simple as that, okay? And I'll explain what that means a bit in a moment. And the idea we have behind that is that we can make engineering globally responsible. So if we can put global responsibility into engineering, we can find a way of balancing those competing needs of people and planet. So, firstly, people needs. Look, everybody needs a certain amount of resource. There's no getting away from that. We've all got human rights. We're all, we all have a right to a decent life. And those rights are described, in, in one way at least, in terms of the sustainable development goals. I'm not going to go through the sustainable development goals. I'm sure you've all heard of them. But they, they, they are basically saying things like, you need a level of education, you need a level of sanitation, you need a level of housing, you need some way of, of earning an income, all these things. We need everywhere throughout the world, not just in the UK, but in every country. And, um, but how do we achieve those things? Because all of those activities require resource. Okay? They're all going to use resource. And on the other side of the, the, the equation, you've got the planet's needs. Now, this diagram shows you a model that's been developed by someone called Jan Ruckström, who is a leading thinker in this, in this space from the, uh, the Stockholm Center of Resilience. And what he came up with is a model here, which I'm going to show you a video of, so I won't go into it too much. But basically what he's saying is, the plant, just as human beings have these 17 development goals, the planet has a number of planetary boundaries. And he's come up with nine of them. So some of them you'll be familiar with. So we, we can't deplete the ozone there beyond a certain level. Otherwise, we're going to be at serious risk. We can't allow the oceans to reach a particular level of acidity. Otherwise, we'll start to see the collapse of fish stocks and so on. So let me just show you a very short video of Yan. <coughs> I'm hoping this is going to work, because I, having seen it not work earlier, Take a moment. Are we on there? Ah, I don't think we're on Wi Fi, are we? Yeah, it's on Wi Fi. Go back one. Should be in bed, should not there? Yeah. It's not going to work. Is it? No, I can't stand it. Okay, well, never mind, never mind. It's not a problem. It's what I'll do, is I'll just go back to this diagram. So let me describe it. Uh, he does it much more eloquently than me. I recommend you watch Jan Rockstrom on Google. Three minutes of free CPD is brilliant. Now, this, this says, look, here's, here's the planet. We have these, these novel entities, which are these chemicals, so microplastics, for example, in, 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 in the environment. Uh, how we use fresh water, uh, the biochemical flows, so things like nitrogen and phosphorus reaching uh, our, our water streams from uh, largely from agricultural activity actually. And basically the idea is you can move so far in using these, um, in, 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 in stressing these limits of the boundaries and still be safe, okay? But there comes a point when you're entering a danger zone or and there comes a point when you're entering red zones where we're, 
we're asking too much of the planet. Climate change is clearly one of those areas where we're, we're very much into the orange slash red zone already. So now, people on one side, planet on the other. How does that come together? Well, there's a model by Kate Roworth, who's a very well-respected, um, a very eloquent, I have to say, economist, who talks about how you uh, how you balance these needs of people on planet. What she did was she took the diagram that Rockstrom had, that planetary limit uh, idea, and she takes the SDGs through two circles. And the first, the inner circle basically says, you need a certain amount of food, you need a certain amount of water, you need a certain amount of, of income and education in order to have a decent life. That's just necessary for all human life. But there's a point at which you overshoot. But if you're getting too much of these resources, then it's no longer sustainable. And this results in something called a donut. And the, she has developed a whole idea called donut economics. So the idea that we have within Engineers Without Borders is to respect those principles of donut economics. Uh, really well worth reading up on this. It's a very clear uh, idea. And we're saying that how can we find a way that engineering can contribute to a world in which we live within that donut space, within that range? People are getting a decent life, but we're not overstepping the mark on the planet's resources. Now, as for the role of engineering, clearly, you all know, engineering shapes the world that we live in today. Now, for good, sometimes, but not so good. And the question then is, well, how are we going to make sure that engineering can continue to shape the world, but in a way that gets us onto a sustainable path and off the unsustainable path we're currently on? Now, there's a skills gap shortage. This is a, a very recent report. The UK could be, could be, they say, walking towards uh, a, a net zero skill shortage. I wouldn't say could be. I'd say absolutely, definitely sprinting towards a net zero skill shortage. But they've they've decided to, to be polite in their words. Uh, another report saying here that 93% of engineering companies that have a sustainability strategy that want to do something about sustainability say. They have not got the staff with the right skills to make it happen. So, skills gap. And uh, a letter here uh, from the uh, Joint Board of Moderators from, uh, I think, about 18 months ago, saying, absolutely, we've got to put the issue of climate change, and this, this is just climate change. I'm talking about sustainability in the round, but they're talking about climate change. But the issue of climate change right in the culture of education and engineering. And that letter was supported by the seven largest professional services firms in engineering. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, we ran a roundtable for about an hour and a half with chief executives of the Professional Engineering Institute in the UK. And during that, we said to them many things, but one of the things we asked them was, how do you see the future skills for engineers? Where do we need to put more emphasis than we are currently? And they came up with statements like this, more emphasis on resilience, creativity, social environmental skills. How do you help a community make a change? That's quite an interesting idea for a skill for an engineer. Uh, and I, I quite like this one myself. Somebody saying, asking engineers to understand that today's solution might turn out to be tomorrow's problem. So how do you think longer term in addressing those risks? Now, I'm not expecting you to read all this. I'm not going to read it all out. But we've come up with the idea, I've mentioned global responsibility in engineering, but it's based on four principles, responsible, purposeful, inclusive, and regenerative. And we'll talk a bit more about that later in the questions. And we turn those into three key competence areas. Okay, these are, remember, these are not technical skills. These are what you would call critical thinking skills, softer skills. I, I don't like the word soft skills, softer skills, perhaps. So what are your knowledge competences? as an engineer or any professional for that matter. What's your skill set competencies and what's your mindset? This is great having the knowledge, great having the skills. If you've got the wrong mindset, you're not going to apply this skills in a way that's helpful. And then we have, we grid this out again, I'm not going to read all this out, but we've grid this out, those three branch areas of competence against the four principles to say how can we turn this into a competency framework that can be applied to professionals across the sector, different specialisms. So a chemical engineer 
could use this, so too could a civil engineer have the chartered vehicle. Now, which brings me to the point uh, of, of my talk, which is about the partnership approach that, that we take. And that's what, what Peter asked me to come and talk about. So the ecosystem of partners that we have in our organization, universities, communities, business, and the professional point. So with universities, we're working with universities in partnership to co-create real world educational resources through, for example, workshops, designathons and hackathons, and the creation of resources for university learning. Now, as university, that's not for the benefit, not just of the students, by the way, for the benefit of the educators. There's a big message we get as the educators say that we want to teach sustainability, just don't know how. So this is a big part of what we're doing too. Um, also with universities, we're, we're very active in university engagement at the student level directly. So we have chapters all around the UK where the students basically take their initiative to improve their learning about sustainable practices. They go out and do schools outreach. They might have industry speakers come and speak to them as students. They're involved in various activities. Um, then business engagement. We're working with businesses to try and build up advocacy for sustainable approaches. There was a, a report by Ernst and Young, EY, uh, pretty recently saying that, you know, the real problem is there's lots of companies with people who have the word sustainability in their title, and somebody, usually the CEO, thinks that that person is going to solve the sustainability issue for them. It's their problem because it's their job title. No, it's not going to happen. You know that. It's only going to happen if everybody in the organization is behind the sustainability mission, and not just behind it, actually acting in a way that's making it real. So we've recognized that, and we're working with Jacobs, we've been working with them for the past year, on a program which brings together a group of professionals within their body, within their organization, who are acting as advocates. So not only are they responsible for sustainability <laughs> within Jacobs, we're equipping them to be advocates so that they're not working on their own. They're empowered to challenge colleagues at every level, right up to the board, to really embed sustainability practices. So that's a program where we're running with them and we can do with others. It's a very interactive program, I should say. Um, professional bodies. Now, we're working with um, the Royal Academy of Engineering. We're working with um, the Engineering, Prof Engineering Professor Council, BEI, that we've started a conversation with, about how you map the curriculum in universities so that we can find a way of saying, well, how do you put sustainability into each stage of the curriculum of different undergraduate uh, and maybe even second degree, high level degree courses? We we're working on a database of resources that they can use for that educational process. The competency framework obviously feeds into all of that and working on guidelines for accredited courses. So there's a lot happening there. And the idea is that you know, we're recognizing that the professional bodies are very, very good at technical skills, right? They know how to do that, they know how to respect it. They have their, their routes to qualification, all very, very well established. We don't need to come in and try and do anything with that. What we're trying to do is say, well, how do you overlay these responsibility competences on top of your very well established technical skills? Now, communities, let me say a bit about this. Um, Three pictures up there, and I'm just going to describe three different communities. First one on the left there is a picture of a community in Johannesburg. It's an area called Makers Valley. And what that essentially is about is people coming together and they're able to be self employed, able to be entrepreneurial, start up their own little companies, manufacturing stuff or providing services. And we, what we did with them was we ran a design challenge for our 10,000. Uh, in several countries, uh, and we, we went to that community and we talked about what are your needs as a community, okay? And we provide from that a design brief, which says, look, this is, this is the situation that people live in there. This is the cultural background to how they, they, uh, they operate. This, these are their needs, their hopes, their aspirations. This is the, the environmental, including the climatic situation in which they live, social situation, and so on and design a brief around their needs 
which we then take to universities in the UK, in Ireland, in the United States, and in Africa. We take that brief to those universities and we say to students, as part of your curriculum, how would you as an engineer, what would your intervention be that would be appropriate to the needs of that community? And then that becomes a design challenge. And if, if the next slide works, which is a video, you'll get to see that. It doesn't depend on you. Um, now, this picture here is, is, is about Cape York in Australia, the northernmost part of Australia. And last year, we ran our design challenge for the community there. We worked with something called the, the Center for Appropriate Technologies. And that is a community body which is looking at what are the appropriate technologies for this part of the world. It doesn't look very big on the map, but this is a pretty big area. It, people are pretty dispersed. The roads are you know, pretty much dirt roads. It's a very, very difficult area to work with. People are struggling to make a living. There's all sorts of challenges. A lot of what they're doing is off grid. So how, as an engineer, do you make interventions that are going to improve their lives and help them to meet those sustainable development goals that I mentioned, while staying within that donut, if you like, the kind of thing you found it. Down here, this is this year's design challenge that we're running for a community in Glasgow, in Govan. And very, very different set of circumstances, because they've got lots of infrastructure, right? I mean, there's not a lot of infrastructure here in Cape York. Lots of infrastructure in Glasgow, but built for a different time. An era when shipbuilding and heavy industry was the main employer. An era when it was a pretty homogeneous society. Now we've moved on, right? We've got old housing stock, which needs to become energy efficient. We've got a post-industrial economy. We've got a much more diverse community. So we developed a design brief for them uh, as part of our challenge for the students this year. Now, I'm going to see, does this work? Let's give it a go. It's not going to work, is it? It's not going to work. Skip it. Um, right. What that was going to be was it was going to show you the, the design brief flipping through all the pages so you'd see just what a professional brief document it is to get the students really, really in-depth thinking about the music community. And the sort of challenge areas that we ask people to look at, the students, are well, think about transport, think about the built environment, think about food, think about water, sanitation. What are the needs of these communities that you can make, uh, that you can improve? Now, I have got another slide after this, which is a video which isn't going to show, so I won't talk about that. This, this is, what I want to say is, is the design challenge that I mentioned. So 10,000 students in a number of countries around the world coming together each year for maybe 100 hours of learning as part of their undergraduate curriculum. That's where our partnership ecosystem comes together. Because you've got the students looking at the needs of communities and sort of talking to the communities. We provide videos to community leaders and so on. So they're understanding the needs of communities and working out how what they do is going to help them. The educators are helping the students on that journey. And the educators, through this process, are learning about what is sustainability in engineering. It's a, a learning process for the education as well. The business partners that we have are involved in this. They're sponsoring this work. And they're also providing experienced professionals to act as mentors for the students, to assess the students' work. And then it's all taken to a grand final where we have 36 finalists and three winners, and we celebrate all the great learning that, that has happened. So thank you very much indeed for your attention, and I look forward to answering any questions.